Moving into our first presentation in session two, we'll learn about quality considerations and controls for drug products containing nanomaterials. Where are we and how we get here? By Dr. Haling Zhang, branch chief in the Office of Life Cycle Drug Products, Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Our next presentation is on advanced separations and detection and assessment of drug quality for drug products containing nanomaterials. This will be presented by Dr. William Smith, research scientist in the Office of Testing and Research in OPQ. And for our final presentation before the Q&A panel, this will be on our regulatory science programs and outreach by Dr. Tina Morrison, director in the Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation and the Office of the Chief Scientist. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the morning session on benefit and lessons on continuous manufacturing. This afternoon's session will focus on regulatory considerations and outreach. My presentation will discuss quality considerations and control for drug products containing nanomaterials. I'm hoping to share with you some valuable experiences that we have gained by assessing and approving two important drug products, namely Daxo and Amparto. Daxo was uh, approved in 1995 by FDA as the first liposome drug product while Amparto is a more recent approval in 2018. Amparto is a lipid complex injection where uh, siRNA partisan is encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles. Uh, I would like to start my presentation by telling you a successful story of liposome drug products and sharing with you what we have learned in the past three decades by working with pharmaceutical industry and academia to develop and regulate liposome drug products. The second part of my presentation will shift to a new legend, lipid nanoparticle drug products. I will end my presentation by providing you uh, some closing thoughts for this topic. FDA has approved 12 liposome drug products since 1995. Most of them are indicated for the treatment of certain cancer. Other conditions being treated include fungi infection, pain management, uh, etc. Uh, most of the drug products are administered through intravenous route. Every case kit was recently approved in 2018 as an oral inhalation to treat certain lung disease. Generic liposome drug products development has made significant progress in past decade. Uh, with the implementation of the GDUFA user fee program, FDA is able to invest substantial resources uh, to work closely with industry and facilitate the development and the regulation of generic liposome drug products. Uh, for example, Office of Generic Drug Products has developed and published product-specific guidance, or PSG, for several liposome drug products, including doxorubicin hydrochloride liposome injection, amphotericin B liposome injection, vertiporphin for injection, bupivacaine liposome injectable suspension, perfluorine lipid microsphere injectable suspension, aritantico hydrochloride liposome injection, Cytarobin and Donald Rubinson liposome for injection. The orchestrated effort between pharmaceutical industry and FDA has led the approval of five generic submissions for doxorubicin hydrochloride liposome injection and two submissions for amphotericin B liposome injection. We are also so working with industry on numerous pre-submission programs for many other drug products in this category. In addition to product-specific guidance, FDA has published several guidance for industry on this topic, which is summarized in the report, Nanotechnology over a decade of progress and innovation 
issued by the FDA Nanotechnology Task Force in July 2020. I would like to highlight two of the guidance which provide recommendations for human drugs. The first one is liposome drug products, chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, uh, human pharmacokinetics, and bioavailability and labeling documentations. This guidance communi communicates our current thinking and provides recommendations for developing liposome drug products. The second guidance is entitled Drug Products, including biological products that contains nanomaterials, was finalized uh, in April 2022. My colleague, Dr. Dr. Olan Stephans, provided a wonderful discussion on this guidance in last year FDA Nano Day Symposium. In the interest of time, I would recommend you watching his presentation if you would like to know more about this guidance. Since the approval of Doxo in 1995, we have, made, we have much better understanding of liposome drug products, drug, drug products. Comparing to drug products with simple formulation, the quality framework of liposome drug products require more rigorous characterization program, uh, particularly to characterize the important liposome physical chemical properties. The characterization program of a liposome drug product should be based on the desired quality attributes um, to achieve the optimum clinical outcomes. In the past few decades, a great deal of uh, research has devoted to understand how formulation design, uh, such as the molecular structure and relative concentration of lipids, together with manufacturing process, such as uh, drug loading method, size reduction method, um, can lead to the desired quality attributes. For example, uh, high drug loading efficiency, uh, desired and consistent liposome size and the size distribution. Based on rigorous characterization program, Quality control of a liposome drug product can be achieve, achieved with testing of certain properties with adequate justification. In summary, how uh, do we achieve high quality batch-to-batch -batch consistent liposome drug product? We heavily rely on quality by design to understand the risk in terms of how formulation and the manufacturing process would impact the drug product quality, which can lead an uh, effective mitigation strategy. Due to the complexity of liposome drug products when it comes to characterization and testing, we expect two orthogonal methods to be developed when it comes to characterize some physical chemical properties such as surface chemistry, morphology, and sometimes size and size distribution. Due to the conventional um, methods used in characterizing and testing liposome drug products, sometimes method validation is overlooked by sponsors. Today, I would like to take these opportunities to uh, emphasize that we evaluate method validation from any methods in the submission with the same regulation requirements uh, those requirements can be found in various guidance issued by FDA or other regulatory entities such as USP and ICH. Now I will shift the discussion to the new legend, lipid nanoparticles or LNPs. Lipid nanoparticles almost become a household term recently due to their application in the uh, development of mRNA vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, the understanding and advancement of liposome drug product in half century has laid out a solid foundation for the speedy development of using uh, LMPs for genetic drugs. In the review article entitled uh, Lipid Nanoparticle Sy Systems uh, for Enabler Gene Therapy, uh, published in Molecular Therapy in 2000, 2017, the author states the origins of LNP systems used for genetic drugs lie in the development of liposomal drug delivery systems for small molecule drugs.
Liposome systems for delivery um, of small molecule drugs represent a uh, relatively uh, mature-like technology and have led to a rigorous design criteria. Uh, many of those criteria uh, can carry over uh, into the design of LNP systems for delivery of uh, genetic drugs, uh, including a uh, size range of 100 nanometer or less, high encapsulation efficiency, circulation longevity, uh, robust scalable manufacturing processes, and stability. Uh, in the development of Amparto to targeted delivery of uh, siRNA partisering to haptocytes, some uh, other specific requirements are identified. Uh, for example, in the early stage of the development, it was challenging to achieve high encapsulation efficiency. The introduction of uh, ionizable canalic lipids uh, provide a feasible solution. Um, in addition, it requires a neutral charge on the external membrane surface of the particles to avoid extensive adsorption of serum protein onto the uh, lipid nanoparticles. It, it is also discovered that PAC lipid containing short assay chains uh, that can dissociate from the uh, lipid nanoparticle in vivo with relatively short half-time will result in optimum haptocyte gene silencing uh, potency. If we compare DOXA to Amparto, we notice that uh, HSPC and cholesterol are used in both formulations as a structural lipids. Uh, both drug products include a uh, PEG lipid derivative, but with different uh, molecular structures. However, Amparto also includes an ionizable canalic lipid in the formulation. Two novel lipids are used in the um, Amparto formulation. Uh, first of all, is the uh, ionizable canaolic lipid d mc 3 DMA. During the development, a few dozens of ionizable canaolic lipids were evaluated for the optimum uh, delivery of uh, partisering. These lipids differ in the head groups, uh, linkers, and hydrocarbon chain length and type. Uh, d mc 3 DMA uh, it's the final selection. Its molecular structure is showing here. This ionizable canaolic lipid is designed to uh, control particle formation, encapsulation of siRNA, cellular uptake, of fusogenicity, and endosome release of the siRNA. Particularly, the amine group, amine pKa, is optimized to be around uh, 6.4. Um, so, uh, it is a positively charged at the acidic pH, um, but neutral in the blood. Therefore, at the acidic pH, positively charged amino head group can complex with the uh, lactively charged phosphate backbone of the siRNA to facilitate association and achieve high efficient, uh, encapsulation efficiency. Uh, then the pH is uh, elevated to uh, approximately Metally seven, so surface charge of the uh, lipid nanoparticle is neutral in the finished drug product, resulting in a longer circulation uh, lifetime. A novel um, PAG lipid uh, is, the, is also developed for um, partial. PAG lipids are used in liposome or um, lipid nanoparticle formulation to stabilize the particle by forming uh, a protective hydrophilic layer uh, that shields the hydrophobic lipid particle, therefore preventing the association with serum protein, leading to a uh, longer circulation time. A packed lipid is also used to control the uh, particle size. Uh, for example, um, higher levels of packed lipid lead to a smaller uh, na uh, lipid nanoparticle systems. In addition, Modulating the RK chain length of the PAC lipid controls the rate of PAC lipid dissociation from the particle, 
therefore impacting the pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamic of the uh, encapsulated uh, uh, siRNA. Comparing to uh, carbon-18 acyl chain used in most liposome formulation, uh, the use of a pack lipid containing uh, carbon-14 acyl chains uh, leads to a quick dissociation from RNP in vivo with a half time less than 30 minutes, uh, then resulting in optimum hepatocyte gene silencing potency. If we compare uh, the drug loading method between Doxo and Enpartro, we notice a high encapsulation efficiency is achieved uh, through different loading mechanisms. Doxo utilized active drug loading method by an iron gradient. Uh, Doxorubensin hydrochloride solution is incubated with liposomes where the internal aqueous compartment contains a higher concentration of ammonium sulfate. Um, Doxo molecule is uh, protonated in external media, then uh, partitioning across uh, the liposome lipid bilayer. Once Dox is in the internal aqueous compartment, it will precipitate as a Doxo sulfate crystalline which drives more uh, dox molecule uh, across the uh, lipid bilayer, um, therefore uh, to achieve the high drug loading efficiency. For Ampartol, the ionizable lipid complexes with negatively charged siRNA in the acidic environment um, by electrostatic interaction, which facilitate association and encapsulation. An um, ethanol loading process is developed to achieve high encapsulation efficiency. Uh, manufacturing of liposome and um, lipid nanoparticle keeps evolving. Uh, extrusion method is widely employed in research and early stage development. For example, extrusion is used to achieve desired particle size in the production of doxo. Homogenization method is also develop, developed and used to produce uh, some liposome drug products. More recently, ethanol loading method uh, is developed. For example, Amparto is using a T-tube mixing process uh, where lipid dissolved in ethanol were rapidly mixed with uh, oligonucleotides in the aqueous buffer, uh, resulting in efficient loading of nucleic acid into a small um, lipid nanoparticle systems. Uh, from the morning session, you probably also know that the same principle is used to, to develop a continuous manufacturing process for producing liposomes and other drug delivery systems containing nanomaterials. To uh, facilitate the assessment and approval of drug products containing nanomaterials, FDA has invested substantial resources on method development and validation, standards development, and training in this area. In addition to research projects conducted by FDA, we have close collaborations with various stakeholders, including other regulatory entities, standards uh, organizations, pharmaceutical industry, as well as academia. Um, in terms of characterization and testing of Amparto, um, what we have learned from uh, liposome drug products become very valuable. Uh, morph morphology, surface charge, particle size and the size di distribution, encapsulation efficiency, and in vitro release uh, are considered critical quality attributes and are thoroughly characterized. To close my presentation, I uh, will try my best to, to discuss the question, where are we going? Uh, this figure is taken from the uh, FDA 2020 Nanotechnology Task Force report I mentioned before. From this figure, uh, we can see since 1970, FDA uh, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research has received more than six, 600 applications, including INDs, NDAs, and ANDAs for human drug products containing nanomaterials, uh, and half of which 
were submitted within the uh, last 10 years. In these submissions, the most commonly seen drug delivery systems are liposomes, nanocrystals, emulsions. Uh, most indications of post, uh, cancer, inflammation, immune and pain condition, and also infection. And most of the drug products uh, are for intravenous uh, administration. The report emphasized a, uh, a science-based, product-focused regula regulatory uh, policy. Uh, in line with the policy, I would like to provide a few final thoughts for developing a drug product containing nanomaterials. Uh, first, quality by design should be implemented when considering the design and the intent of the nanomaterial. A risk-based approach should be adopted through the entire development pro uh, and, for example, uh, process risks uh, should be identified with a corresponding control strategy. Uh, characterization is key uh, through development, uh, focusing on adequacy of analytical methods, sampling strategy, and orthogonal methods. Finally, we encourage industry to consult with the agency early in the product development. For example, pre-IND meeting for NDA submission and the pre-development meeting for ANDA submission. At last, I would like to thank uh, many colleagues uh, from FDA, especially the ones who helped me prepare uh, this presentation. Uh, three from OLDP OPQ IQA review team, um, Pahala, Bing, and Andre from OLDP OPQ leadership team. Um, special thanks to Olin and Marie, um, so, who spent their valuable time to uh, discuss with me uh, on the this topic, as especially reviewing um, and portal and share their. Uh, valuable um, expertise and experiences. Uh, I mean, I'm very grateful for the uh, long-term collaboration in this area uh, with Xiaoming, Darby, Yan, Wenlei, and uh, Ji Wen. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, please make sure if you have any questions, please ask me during the uh, question and answer panel discussion session at the end of uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am uh, William C. Smith. I'm a research scientist in the Office of Testing Research uh, here at the FDA, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the advanced analytical methods that we're using for the assessment of drug product quality for things containing nanomaterials uh, and some of the research that we've done in that vein. The process of creating a nanomaterial containing product often goes through uh, some fundamental steps from the initial synthesis uh, to the stabilization or functionality of the particles, um, of course, the purification, and uh, importantly to us, the characterization of those uh, nanomaterial containing products. As we've heard from some of the other speakers, our ability to produce more and more complex nanomaterials uh, is ever increasing with uh, the new developments in things like continuous manufacturing. But there still seems to be a disparity between our ability to synthesize more complex products and our ability to uh, thoroughly characterize these products. And this, uh, is because most of these nanomaterial containing products have a wide distribution in things like both the size, the chemical composition, the bulk composition, and things like surface functionality. The problem arises from the fact that many of the ensemble techniques that we are using currently are just determining the average of one such property. And that might not be suspicious sufficient for these types of products where you have multiple concurrent distributions of these properties occurring. In general, we know that nanoparticle 
properties fall into things like the physical, the compositional, and interfacial. And as we make more and more complex systems, uh, like say a biotheranostic, where we want to have a targeting agent, maybe an antibody, a stabilizer like PEG, some kind of uh, tracing or imaging component, um, we have to be able to identify all of these uh, individual properties well. And so as these nanomaterials are becoming more complex, how do we address these simple individual property questions? Uh, and specifically, we'll talk a little today about uh, size distribution and morphology. Even for something as uh, relatively simple as measuring the particle size, uh, for a complex product, say like cyclosporin ophthalmic emulsions, uh, the the task becomes more and more difficult, uh, and the use of a number of complementary techniques uh, really adds to uh, understanding exactly what we're looking at, um, or really identifying the whole elephant here. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to point out to you here in the bottom right hand uh, is uh, AF4 MALS or uh, asymmetrical field flow fractionation with multi-angle light scattering technique. Now, this is one of those separation techniques that allows us to not only get an average particle size uh, like many of these other ensemble techniques, uh, but also to look at individual subpopulations and the concentration of particles that fall within those size ranges. Critically, the use of this multiple complementary particle sizing technique approach uh, produced results from the research that provided pivotal support uh, to develop uh, a PSG and led to the approval of the first uh, cyclosporin ophthalmic generic products. And this is also another kind of pivotal moment where uh, this was the first time that asymmetrical flow field flow fractionation uh, was used uh, as part of a uh, package to support bioequivalence determination for these. Uh, today we're going to be focusing really on liposomes, but uh, these separation techniques can really be extended to a whole host of nanoparticulate or uh, macromolecular and polymer systems uh, to look at things like the particle size, the molar mass, uh, surface charge, also morphological conformation and shape. Uh, what's really nice is that we can also get this kind of secondary property information like uh, how the drug is distributed, uh, possible aggregation and stability information, etc. cetera. Um, so today uh, we're going to focus in on uh, asymmetrical flow field flow fractionation, but we do have a host of other uh, advanced separation techniques that we are investigating thoroughly uh, in the FDA laboratories. So field flow fractionation is a class of chromatography-like analytical separation techniques uh, that was developed first for macromolecular and colloidal separations and enables you to investigate analytes in the one nanometer to tens of micron size range. Uh, also, different instrumentation is available that provides different types of external fields. Uh, so thermal, electrical, in this case, we'll be talking about a, a flow variety. Uh, but the selection of field actually allows you to separate based on different analyte physicochemical properties. In many ways, a field flow fractionation uh, system in the laboratory is set up fundamentally like a chromatographic system with a pump and a suite of detectors uh, that provide you some kind of information. Uh, but the fundamental difference is uh, between the pump and detector suite, instead of being a column, is a channel. So let's look at the mechanism here for how this might differ. In field flow fractionation, a thin ribbon-like spacer is sandwiched between two blocks uh, through which you flow your liquid. And an external field is, is applied in order to uh, cause some kind of uh, migration of the particles. Uh, when you're flowing at these uh, in a laminar flow condition, a parabolic flow profile is produced. And as your analyte is interacting with that perpendicular uh, field, 
uh, with respect to the flow, it will accumulate next to uh, one of the walls. Uh, this buildup in concentration is then counteracted by Fick's first law of diffusion, uh, and the translational diffusion of the particles lifts them uh, to different mean layer thicknesses uh, in the channel. Uh, they therefore see uh, different, uh, on average, different average velocity profile uh, streams inside of the system, which leads to differential uh, elution of the analytes. Uh, when you're using an asymmetrical flow system, uh, this is solely based on diffusional transport, and therefore you get separation by size with the smallest particles with the highest diffusion coefficient coming out first, and the largest particles with the lower translational diffusion coefficients coming out afterwards. In general, some of the benefits of this open channel design uh, lend themselves to uh, low shear stress, so you're able to analyze things like uh, loosely bound aggregates or uh, protein coronas on uh, interacting nanoparticle systems. Uh, you don't tend to need to uh, filter your samples because it can handle things up into the micron size range, as uh, you can see from the wide analyte size range. Uh, you can use a variety of carrier liquids um, because there's minimal interaction between a stationary phase, as there is no stationary phase, uh, you tend to have limited sample loss, uh, and you can uh, upsize your channel to uh, run anything from in the nanogram quantities up into the milligram quantities for some of the semi-preparative systems. Uh, so let's take a look uh, at where we're applying this uh, field flow fractionation technique. Uh, in our uh, current research at that. Uh, so in the following section, we're gonna look at how we're using some of these field flow fractionation techniques uh, as methods, not only for determining particle size distribution, but also we're going to look at assessing uh, their capability for uh, determining mor morphological variability in liposomal drug products. So this whole project was really made possible through our collaboration with University of Connecticut. And as Tony has already talked about, their continuous manufacturing setup for producing liposomes. Uh, really key to this whole process is that uh, the continuous manufacturing system can produce particles with well-controlled particle size and well-controlled drug loading. Those two things in combination allow you to produce particles uh, with really controlled morphology or shape. And this is uh, really fundamental to our ability uh, for assessing our analytical methodologies as uh, creating a well-controlled and well-defined analyte library uh, is critical for the assessment of your methodologies. Uh, so let's put our uh, continuous manufacturing derived liposomes from Yukon into perspective here. Uh, we have uh, an AF4 fractogram with our concentration detector intensity on the y-axis and retention time on the x-axis. Uh, our Yukon sample here in the gray and two products uh, that we tested with uh, two specific lots from uh, one of the products uh, here and some uh, representative TEM images for those. What we can see is that there is uh, both polydispersity in size, uh, you can see kind of from the breadth, but also in morphology from uh, the, the distribution of uh, both spherical and prolate ellipsoids here. Uh, overlaid also on this is the online DLS detection. Uh, so we're getting hydrodynamic sizes for each of these particle populations. Uh, across the peak as it elutes, and we can take this signal and integrate it uh, with respect to the concentration detection for each of these specific sizes in order to produce uh, a particle size distribution. Now we did this integration process for a number of different samples. So here are our uh, uh, Yukon samples. Uh, we can see we have uh, varying levels of polydispersity and monodispersity, um, and we also display this in terms of two different number 
and uh, weight-based distribution, so skewed more towards the intensity or the light scattering versus skewed towards the number-based intensity from the concentration. Um, we did this, of course, also um, with uh, the commercially available products with several lots. Um, and so what's the point of having both of these uh, weight and number-based distributions uh, will become evident here on the next slide. Now, what you can see here is uh, two of our samples uh, where we have overlaid the number and weight-based distributions uh, for each of these samples. Uh, they have approximately equivalent Z average from batch DLS, uh, but different polydispersities. And this becomes very evident when we uh, look at our particle size distributions from the separation techniques where uh, the bigger deviation from number and weight-based distributions uh, is exemplary of uh, polydispersity versus uh, a more monodisperse system where the number and weight-based uh, distributions are uh, nearly equivalent. Moving away from our more typical particle size distribution analysis, we can start to uh, think about how to assess liposomal morphology or shape uh, using our uh, advanced separation and detection uh, suite. And so here we just have some representative TEM images of some of the Yukon samples that were produced uh, where we have uh, linear crystal morphology with spherical shape, uh, linear uh, crystal morphology with an elongated particle shape, or a circular or spherical particle shape with a uh, circular doxorubicin crystal. And again, this is all uh, produced using that continuous manufacturing process where we can uh, create these empty liposomes and then actively load them and control that loading process in order to, uh, in a controlled manner, make these different morphologies. Uh, without getting too detailed, one of the ways that we're going to investigate uh, both, you know, the particle shape and the particle size is through a use of this uh, online detector suite. So one, we have a multi-angle light scattering system. Uh, and what this enables us to do is to look at the intensity with respect to the angle of the light scattered for the analyte as it passes through the detector uh, inside of this P theta term. Uh, we can extract the uh, root mean squared radius or radius of gyration from the slope of this dependence. Uh, that tells us something about how the mass is distributed uh, within the particle. And we can compare that uh, to the DLS-based size, which is actually based on the Stokes-Einstein equation or the diffusion coefficient, which gives us our hydrodynamic size. So uh, the spherical equivalent size for uh, something that is diffusing through a medium. And uh, just for uh, clarity's sake, we're using a uh, Barry second order for all of the data that I'm showing you here from the malls fitting. Now we can take these uh, two sizes from our multi-angle and our dynamic light scattering online. We can make a ratio um, that helps us understand something about how uh, the mass is distributed or the morphology or what we call the shape factor or row value here uh, for our particles. So just for instance, a hollow sphere uh, will have the majority of its mass or its radius of gyration based size distributed out towards the edge if it's a perfectly uniform shell, uh, very near the hydrodynamic uh, radius of the particle. Uh, this is in contrast to say a uniformly dense sphere uh, where there is more mass distributed uh, towards the center uh, than towards the hydrodynamic uh, volume uh, edge. And of course we can make some theoretical predictions about what this uh, row value would be for things like rods or prolate spheroids which uh, tend to be what a lot of these doxorubicin and liposomes end up looking like. Now in practice, this is what the data actually looks like, is we have our fractogram here, the same fractogram overlaid one with the hydrodynamic radius. So you can see we have equivalent hydrodynamic radiuses at these different sizes. Um, 
And what's really interesting, though, is when we look at the root mean square radius or radius of gyration values, you can see that at equivalent retention times, so equivalent hydrodynamic sizes, we have differences in our root mean square radius or radius of gyration. Now, when we take those two values and make our row ratio, um, what we can see is that for something that's uh, uniformly spherical with this linear crystal, we get one specific row value. And for one of our exemplary uh, elongated samples, we get a different row value. And of course, for our uh, circular crystal morphology in a circular particle, we get, uh, again, a different row value. So we can take that for all those uh, 16 different uh, samples that we looked at and we can kind of crunch the numbers on what those look like on average. Uh, so for our 16 samples, we ended up uh, calculating our row values at full width half max and averaging over each of the peaks, and then pooling these values based on the observed TDM morphologies. And we can see a trend uh, that follows more or less with the theory uh, that our hollow spheres end up uh, around a row value of one uh, with a slight elevation for our elongated or prolate ellipsoid with respect to our uh, spherical particle with a, a solid uh, linear core. And so um, one of our questions is when is uh, elongation elongated enough? And so we're uh, looking into also analyzing more rod-like uh, liposomes in order to fit a trend for this entire series. In the end, uh, additional studies are essential for us to really evaluate the appropriateness of the shape factor analysis as a rapid screening method, uh, specifically in the errors involved in different light scattering models, uh, in order to use this as a, a little less cumbersome method uh, as a orthogonal method to TEM shape analysis. Um, again, I really want to highlight the fact that the continuous manufacturing approach uh, really provided us the library of liposomal materials that were needed in order for us to uh, conduct this analysis because we had samples with very controlled sizes, shapes, and polydispersities. For anyone who is interested, there are um, easily locatable protocols and methods being developed um, for field flow fractionation for the analysis of uh, nanomaterials, uh, both from the NCL, the EU NCL, and from ISO, who is uh, working on uh, interlaboratory study to elevate this technical specification to a full international standard. Just to give you a brief look at the breadth of the standardization effort that is underway, uh, there are a number of analytical and regulatory laboratories across the globe that are putting their weight behind uh, the use of advanced separations like FFF uh, for the analysis of nanomaterials like liposomes and lipid nanoparticles. Uh, additionally, there are a set of three uh, ASTM interlaboratory studies that are uh, currently using liposomes produced by continuous manufacturing uh, as one of the materials to be analyzed. And we think that this is a kind of a key role for uh, continuous manufacturing uh, to provide uh, reference materials in the future. Here I've added a truncated list of resources with a couple nice reads and a, a number of these different uh, methodologies that you can peruse at your leisure. Um, hopefully you find these useful. Just wanna take a brief second to acknowledge uh, all my FDA collaborators and everybody who helped me work on these projects, uh, but especially to the Yukon School of Pharmacy team, Tony Costa, um, Dr. Burgess and Gotham, who actually produced these particles that uh, enabled us to start uh, really delving into understanding these analytical procedures. And of course, I'll take any questions at the end. Good afternoon. I am Tina Morrison, the Director of the Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation and the Office of the Chief Scientist at the Food and Drug Administration. I'm delighted to be participating in the 2023 Nano Day Symposium, 
I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give an overview of regulatory science and outreach efforts that we do in our office, which you'll hear me refer to as ORSI. This is the office where we aim to spur innovation through creative collaborations. Before I begin, I want to orient us all just to give you a reference of where we are in the Office of the Chief Scientist. So at the FDA, we are led by the commissioner of the FDA, Dr. Robert Califf, and he oversees not just the six product centers, um, which are the biologics and the drug and the devices center, along with the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, the Center for Tobacco Pro Products, and the Center for Veterinary Medicine. He also oversees scores of what we call component offices in the office of the commissioner. Several of those that are active in the area of regulatory science are, of course, the Office of the Chief Scientist, the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, the Office of Regulatory Affairs, the Office of Women's Health, and the Oncology Center of Excellence, just to name a few. I encourage you to look at the organizational chart of FDA um, if you're curious about other aspects of the Office of the Commissioner. Transition to the Office of the Chief Scientist, we were established in 2012 as a part of um, the goal for the agency to actually connect more science-minded people across the agency. Um, each of the centers have their own science divisions or office, but at the FDA, when we're trying to look at how to coordinate um, science across the agency, we're looking at ways to try to coordinate resources. Um, the Office of the Chief Scientist is where a lot of that coordination takes place. We support the research foundation, the science and innovation that underpins FDA's regulatory mission. We promote scientific excellence and innovation to achieve FDA's mission. And through the National Center for Toxicological Research, we also provide research expertise and infrastructure to the FDA product centers. On the left-hand side, you can see there are eight sub-offices to the Office of the Chief Scientist, each with their own special function. So the counterterrorism and emerging threats, um, scientific um, professional development, we oversee the scientific integrity of work across the agency, laboratory safety, technology transfer, so making sure our scientists have access to um, processes to protect their intellectual property, in addition to a team that works with the, the product centers to execute on the advisory committees. And then you have um, the Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation, which I'll talk with you about over the next few slides. So in ORSI, our vision is to improve and advance public health by accelerating innovations through creative collaborations that harness the best science. And our goal is to um, execute on programs that can deliver on that best science across FDA. We have several programs that we run in ORSI to advance regulatory science. We have four intramural programs and two extramural programs. I'm gonna take a few moments to walk you through each of these programs. And while I do that, I'm also going to highlight different areas in which we've been able to utilize these programs to help advance the areas of nanotechnology and provide support to groups like Anil Patry's group um, in the the FDA NanoCore Center, um, along with folks that are working in the Drug Center and the Devices Center, providing them with mechanisms to advance science that's important to them. So let's begin first with um, ORSI's program impact at a glance. So our office is relatively small, but we have a pretty big impact when it comes to advancing regulatory science at FDA. With respect to the projects that we help facilitate through um, our extramural programs, we actually work with our scientists to fund more than $100 million each year of projects through um, our contracts program and our grants program, which I'll talk about in a few moments. We also, um, through the standards program and the FDA standards executive, we support more than 800 staff who serve on a thousand or more consensus standards committees. Um, and, and I will share some highlights of this in the area of nanotechnology in a few moments. 
In addition to that, we have more than 100 projects that we're managing through the program called the Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, and I'll share with you some updates to that program. We touch hands with more than 1,000 scientists across the agency every year when it comes to looking at and evaluating proposals, serving on technical evaluation committees, engaging on training, education, scientific, scientific workshops. Um, we are a very busy but small, nimble team, um, and we are proud of the work that we do to support science at FDA. But we're not just talking about any kind of science, right? We're, we're even talking beyond applied science and translational science. We typically think about applied science as, okay, I've, I've had some scientific discovery, and now I want to either apply that um, science into developing a new technology, or maybe developing a new product, or even considering um, new approaches. Um, and these technologies we can have, um, we can get our hands on through different um, tools or, or standards even. And then translational science as brought to us by, um, by way of the NIH and the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. It's my perspective that they're really focusing on that bench to bedside. How do I take this science and actually bring some relevance to um, the lives of a patient, right? And then an FDA's role is thinking about, well, how can we do that consistently, um, that bench to bedside consistently for a broad range of projects? And, products. And in order for us to do that, we really need to harness regulatory science. And, and these are different methods, approaches, tools that we can use to help assess the safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of FDA-regulated products. Now, these regulatory science outcomes, if you will, would not just be used by FDA, but also by our industry and academic stakeholders who are thinking about either developing new technologies and how they can apply to FDA or thinking about how they can develop new products and how those products would be regulated by FDA. So it's really important when we think about the scientific work that we're trying to do at the agency, our goal is to really focus on regulatory science. Okay, so that was um, a high level overview of um, ORC's impact and talking about regulatory science. Let's jump into a couple of these programs. So the first program I wanna highlight is the OCS Intramural Grants Program. So we, we manage four FDA-wide grants programs that really allow FDA scientists who are working in novel areas of science to get additional funding outside of their current center or office. So they can apply for funding from one of the FDA um, Office of the Commissioner component office, as I mentioned in my introduction. That's either through the Chief Scientist Challenge Grant, where we look at um, novel collaborations that are cross-cutting, focusing on high-level um, science areas that impact one or more offices, like nanotechnology, like alternative methods. The other offices that also support grant programs is the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats through the Medical Countermeasures Grant. We also have two grants programs, one for the Office of Women's Health and the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And we help support the um, operation and execution of these grant programs. And when we're looking at, uh, we take a few minutes and look at the Chief Scientist Challenge Grant Program, ORC actually has appropriations um, to fund uh, $1 million in new projects and also $1 million for second year funding for the previous year's projects. So we try to provide pro um, funding support for two year projects. And when we started this program more than a decade ago, we originally had two um, program areas, one in the CORES area, where CORES stands for Collaborative Opportunities for Research Excellence in Science. But this program was mainly focused on advancing nanotechnology. What we've done um, here, what you can see on this slide is um, we actually report to Congress yearly on how we've um, spent uh, congressional um, appropriated dollars. And specifically, we've, we've had a specific call out to how we are advancing nanotechnology in support of the Office of Science and Technology Policies, what they call the National Nanotechnology Coordinating Office. Um, and you'll see from last year's congressional justification for our intramural grants program, we actually um, 
discussed that over the last decade where we've been running this program, we've actually funded more than 70 projects in the CORES area focused on nanotechnology standards. Um, and so I will give you a snapshot of some of those standards that have come out of the work uh, from the nanotechnology group. So as I was talking about the FDA standards program, um, the FDA standards executive works in ORSI and actually works across the agency to collaborate specifically with the medical product centers on consensus standards development. We have a database to look at um, standards when they're in draft format and meaning that um, a standard is ready for FDA to comment on those standards. We have a standards committee um, that coordinates with all of the standards liaisons across the agency. Current, an active database of current FDA standards, in particular those that are recognized by the agency to be used in um, regulatory submissions, and also um, access to the portal where we can get um, access to all of the standards um, through the different standards um, developing organizations. Here's a snapshot of the scope of the FDA standards program. As you can see here from each of the uh, product centers that I mentioned before, um, you know, hundreds of standards are being developed and utilized um, by FDA. Um, and, and it's important to note that if you're not familiar with the standards program or standards development organizations, this is a great opportunity for the industry to engage with FDA and others from academia um, on developing methodologies and approaches that can be standardized and used to um, advance regulatory science. So um, just to, here's a snapshot for you on the um, standards that are in nanotechnology. So the nanotechnology has a subcommittee that is focused specifically on consensus standards that impact the area of nanotechnology. This subcommittee has reviewed and commented on, um, they've reviewed at least 75 standards and commented on recently 50 draft um, consensus standards. And you can get access to those standards by looking at the FDA consensus standard database, which is available at FDA.gov. Um, additionally, you will find that there are 23 standards focused on um, uh, nanotechnology that are recognized by the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. So if you've not looked at that database, I encourage you um, to, to check that out. And of course, standards development is always ongoing. There are always new scientific gaps and challenges to um, to tackle. And so what I'm showing here on this slide um, is there are currently seven active work items through the ASTM Standards Development Organization. There is a subcommittee called E56, and there are seven work items that are open. So if this is an area of, if these, um, of the standards that are listed here, if these are areas of interest for you either to engage on, to contribute to the development of that work, or to actually learn from those experts who are developing the standards in those areas, this is a great opportunity for you to get engaged. So if you have any additional questions about standards and nanotechnology, I encourage you to reach out to um, either the director of the FDA NanoCore, which is Anil Patry. You've heard welcoming remarks from him this morning, um, and also the FDA standards executive, Mr. Haney Demian. So their contact information is provided here. One of the other program areas that ORSI um, manages are, is the FDA Scientific Working Groups Program. And this is a very exciting place because this is one of the ways in which we can actually do cross-agency collaborations on science. We have 12 topical scientific groups. In each one of these groups, there are members from each of the FDA product centers and also members from the different component offices that I mentioned earlier. And these folks meet either monthly or quarterly to engage on communication and sharing information, scientific information, information about projects and training, also thinking about ways in which they can establish projects to tackle common goals and objectives, where we're looking at science as it applies, uh, science at the level just before it's applied to any specific product area, for example. Um, the other interesting um, aspect of bringing all these scientists together is it allows them to talk about opportunities to share resources. 
not just to share knowledge, but to think about ways to share infrastructure, to share laboratory space, and to think about how they might collaborate um, and cooperate on projects and maybe even submit projects to the intramural um, grants program. And what I've highlighted for you here is um, the nanotechnology uh, working group, which has been called the Nanotechnology Task Force, as they have been reporting to the um, Office of Science and Technology Policies um, larger um, effort in nanotechnology across the, the federal government. And if you want to learn more about the task force, I provided the, the link below. Okay, so I just gave you a snapshot of the intramural programs um, in ORSI. I'd like to spend some more time on the extramural programs because these are the ways in which we actually engage with our external scientific stakeholders. Before I talk about the specific programs, I want to orient you for a minute to a regulatory science framework. You know, when I've been working at the agency now for 15 years, and when you're talking about science priorities, there's always different ways in which you can communicate science priorities. You can talk about scientific priorities from a product area. You can talk about scientific priorities from a demographic or a population's perspective. You can talk about priorities from things that are emerging, um, public health emergencies, obviously COVID-19 was one of them, but also thinking about misinformation and disinformation. But we can also talk about science uh, priorities fundamentally from the scientific areas, and we can organize them in such a way that we can think about how that science really underpins and supports FDA's mission. So if we look at regulatory science, again, I shared this definition with you earlier, which is really focusing on the ways in which we can harness science through tools or standards or, or you know, qualified approaches that both the stakeholders from outside and inside can utilize to inform the regulatory process. I mentioned we can talk about science from the different product areas, right? We can look at scientific gaps by the population areas, but really what we want to do is to think about science and how the scientific gaps are actually related to the different pillars of the FDA mission. So there are three very specific charges that are related to FDA's scientific mission. The first is to think about how we utilize science to modernize the development and evaluation of FDA regulated products. There is the science around strengthening post-market surveillance and labeling of FDA regulated products. And last, the third charge is invigorating public health preparedness and response of FDA, but also of patients and consumers. In these three different charges, we have identified um, two dozen areas of science that we can tackle through our extramural programs to support the agency. Now, in the short window of time I have today, I can't go through all of the details of those different science areas. Some of those cross-cutting areas are, for example, alternative methods, artificial intelligence, harnessing real-world data, and, and utilizing complex statistical methodologies to think about real-world data becoming real-world evidence. You can find more details about the regulatory science framework on the FDA.gov website. But what does that mean for extramural programs? Well, the first of those programs I want to talk about is the broad agency announcement, or what we call the BAA program. This is where we can establish research and development contracts in a streamlined, nimble way. And the way that we do this is the goal of this program is to really think about um, we have new challenges arising every year, either on the products that we know about that we're trying to develop or new areas of science that are coming down the pipe. And FTA needs to have the ability to be nimble and to be able to adjust our scientific priorities as, um, as the, um, the science and technology changes. And so every single year, FDA publishes through a solicitation for research and development contracts, we publish every year our scientific priorities and we lay them out um, in a document which you can get access to on the sam.gov website. And in that document, we've now structured our scientific priority areas, utilizing the regulatory science framework and looking at ways in which science can advance each of those three charges. 
And this is a way that we engage with our external scientific stakeholders. So this pathway is open to both um, scientific folks in academia, but also in industry, whether you work for um, a specific um, you know, manufacturer or if you're in a laboratory setting. Um, we have a very rigorous review process, and typically I talk about the process at a high level, but we're undergoing um, some changes to that BAA process now, and if you are someone who is interested in the BAA program or want to hear more about the upcoming changes for fiscal year 24, I encourage you to save the date, October 25th, for the BAA day. And the reason for that is we'll, pro we'll provide you with an update to some of the, the program and process changes that are coming. But as you're thinking about how you might apply your expertise to the BAA process, I want you to think about these three important areas. These are the criteria by which we rate the proposals that come through the BAA. And on average, we receive 250 proposals every year, and we can fund around 40 to 45 proposals. This has been our average for the last five or six years. So it's really important that we're looking for robust scientific and technical merit. We want to make sure that there's, a, there's soundness and feasibility in the proposals that are presented. In addition to touching on those key scientific areas, those areas important to the agency programs, which we lay out for you in the solicitation. And last but certainly not least is the capabilities and experience. What are the qualifications of your team and are you, do you have demonstrated success in either other um, BAA uh, proposals or contracts um, that have been issued to you? So this information is really important to our team to get your proposals rated highly because we only fund those, cat those proposals that are rated high. Okay. So those related to nanotechnology. This is just the snapshot um, looking in the BAA database for funded projects in the area of, of nanoscience or related to nanotechnology or nanoparticles. You can see here that there have been um, several projects funded through the BAA over the last five years. Um, fiscal year 23 just closed, so we're still working on the obligated dollars amounts, but we are funding um, the University of Connecticut again. Um, you guys will hear from um, uh, Nicholas today and his um, presentation around um, the work that they're doing at the University of Connecticut in the area um, of um, nanotechnology. And actually, I, I believe there's a presentation from Diane Burgess um, on the continuous manufacturing of liposomes and LNPs. Um, while this slide is only showing one of the contracts, it is my understanding that um, our drug center has actually awarded over the years about $5 million to the University of Connecticut, either through the BAs, but also through our CERCI program, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, and also want to point out that um, last year, thanks to the um, America's Job um, Recovery Act, we were able to fund um, a BAA from the Center for Biologics. We awarded an $82 million contract to MIT on continuous manufacturing of mRNA. Um, and so we're really delighted um, that we were able to take that funding and put it into an institution to advance um, the areas of continuous manufacturing system. Okay, so now I'm going to transition to our cooperative agreement grant program, or the Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, or what we call the CERCES. The CERCES are um, academic institutions that we work with to um, establish uh, regulatory science projects. We do have a request for proposals for different project areas. That being said, this mechanism for engaging with external stakeholders is different than the BAA in that for each of the projects, we have both CERCI um, collaborators and FDA scientists on each of those projects. And a bulk of the work that we do through the CERCI program is through our regulatory science projects. But we also, um, the CERCIs also work on developing workshops and lectures, um, training courses. We have scores of fellowship and scholarship opportunities. We have a regulatory science competition that we put on every year. So there are a lot of different ways in which the CERCES work alongside FDA to advance regulatory science. And I'm proud to announce that we actually have a new CERCES um, institution that we've um, inducted into the program this year. 
We just started our new grant cycle on September 1, 2023. A typical cooperative agreement grant cycle lasts for five years. Um, our newest CIRCE, the Triangle CIRCE, is a, is a collaboration between the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with Duke University, NC State um, University as well. We had a very competitive um, new funding opportunity that we um, established last year. We had almost 30 applications for, um, for establishing um, a new institution, so it was a a very strong competitive process, and we're really excited for um, the four CIRCES that have been working with us the last grant cycle to be renewed and also to bring a new CIRCE on board. I really encourage you to visit uh, the FDA.gov website to, to learn more about each of the specific institutions um, and the, the scope of work that they are doing to support regulatory science at FDA. One of the things I just want to highlight uh, for our program um, is that we've established what we call outcomes of interest. Because the, the bulk of the work that we do through the CIRCE program are regulatory science projects, and at this time we have more than 100 projects that are ongoing, and in total for the decade that we've been running this program, we've had almost 250 um, CIRCE projects. So that, that's quite a lot, and we're trying to think about what's the impact of all those projects. So when we think about establishing a project with our goal to advance regulatory science, our ultimate goal at the end of the day, if we we think of that blue arrow at the bottom of the screen as time is our hope is that by taking these projects and sharing the knowledge that that will catalyze some action in the community either to get more funding for a particular area of science or to establish a new program or effort ultimately getting to the place of finding some tangible outcome that can allow us to inform regulatory decision making and so on this slide, I'm giving you a snapshot of um, information that is detailed on our website, but it's the very specific activities we're looking to, to show impact for our regulatory science projects. And so beyond the disseminating of, of scientific knowledge through, um, through peer-reviewed publications, through presentations and training, we're also looking to further action, which we know can take time. If you've ever done a scientific project, you know that getting to a place where you're catalyzing action can take a few years. And so thinking about, you know, what are some ways in which these projects that we're funding can actually go to the next level and maybe end up as uh, a qualified tool, a consensus standard, a reference material, something that we can actually use in a guidance document that can be used to inform regulatory decision making, both for FDA and our scientific stakeholders in industry and academia. So I encourage you to take a look at these outcomes of interest. And so with that, as I'm coming to a close in my presentation, I just want to take a moment to highlight a project, um, a CIRCE project that's focused on nanotechnology. And this project comes out of the University of Maryland, CIRCE. And this um, project is titled Hyperspectral Interference Scattering Microscopy for Characterizing Nanoparticle-Based Therapeutics. Um, the PI from this, from the University of Maryland, is Dr. Taylor Wool. And we have several FDA SMEs and collaborators on this project from the Center for Drug Evaluation Research. The main impact of this work is to advance uh, regulatory science knowledge, meaning to gain and, and to elevate and increase the scientific knowledge of the FDA um, regulatory teams. The work achieves this um, impact by developing a new approach to rapidly characterize nanoparticle-based drugs, which can be used by the pharmaceutical industry to more completely characterize those drugs. And in particular, the goal is to develop generic nanoparticle-based drugs, that, and that requires rigorous chemical comparison to the name brand originator drug. Currently, there is a lack of analytical tools to fully characterize nanoparticles in drugs, making it difficult for generic drug developers to apply for FDA approval with sufficient data. So this technique helps to, to utilize simple sample preparation, small volume batches, simple data acquisition, 
and has the potential to be made into a high throughput technique. Um, the first um, outcome from this project has been a publication which um, came out recently and the team is working actively to undergo um, the establishment of two additional manuscripts and Dr. Wool actually presented these findings at a recent meeting um, in Portland. So we're very excited. If you want to read more details about the project summary, you can scan the QR code um, that will take you to that page. All right. So in summary today, you heard me give an overview of the different ways in which um, ORSI is trying to establish creative co collaborations with our external scientific partners to harness the best science. We have many programs that connect our scientists across the agency on a myriad of scientific topics, including nanotechnology. We have a small but nimble team to support FDA scientists and collaborators and these are the faces of the folks behind the scenes so thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you our regulatory science outreach efforts and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or follow-up comments thank you so much thank you for the great presentations we'll now enter our final q a panel as a reminder, if you haven't entered your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We do have some few questions coming in right now. The first group of questions will be addressed to Dr. Haling Zhang, and here's the first question for Dr. Zhang. Most of the approved liposomal drug products are administered via intravenous route. What is the rationale? Thanks. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, most approved liposome drug products are either indicated for uh, certain cancer or pain management. Um, therefore, uh, other routes such as oral, um, it's, it's not feasible in terms of the bioavailability. And also, um, most approved liposome drug products are within uh, around like 100 nanometer range, uh, which is also make oral administration uh, challenging uh, in terms of the uh, bioavailability. Um, thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a few more questions that came in for Dr. Zhang, and here's the next question. What is the half-life of lipid particles in blood pH? Uh, Thank you for that question. I think it depends on uh, which drugs we're talking about in terms of um, parto. I believe the uh, half-life is around uh, three days. Um, but for for example, like, uh, Dr. Rubinson, it's about uh, a day, 28 hours to 40 something hours. Um, so it really depends on which drugs we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Zhang, can you provide examples of acceptance criteria for encapsulation efficiency and comment on how critical this metric is for FDA? Also, what is more important, high efficiency, repeatability, or both? Um. That's a great question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for asking that. Uh, so when we're talking about the control, quality control in terms of encapsulation efficiency, um, we usually use the encapsulated drug versus a free drug uh, um, as a testing to, to uh, control this uh, particular property. Uh, it it depends depends on um, what drug we're looking at. For example, uh, Dr. Rubinson will usually look at 97% of encapsulated drug. Um, and for, but for, for example, Ambusum, uh, sorry, Ambusum, we're talking about usually, um, you know, 97 uh, plus percentage of encapsulated drug. The rationale behind it is that uh, for both of these two liposome drug product examples, the free drug usually will lead to toxicity. So we try to uh, minimize um, 
the the percentage of free drug in the finished product. Uh, in terms of the encapsulation efficiency, which is defined uh, as the drug being encapsulated uh, divided by the the drug um, added to the formulation. If we talk about that concept, it really will be decided during the development, depending on the clinical outcome. Um, and usually, high deficiency uh, usually means to to actually high re, re uh, producibility too, um, because you know when we figure out a way to achieve high deficiency, we usually able to. Um, rep rep reproduce the result, you know, have a better process control because you end up losing less drug during the process. So I think the if high efficiency and the rep repeatability actually are somehow correlated if we're looking uh, from the manufacturing process perspective. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Dr. Zhang in this round, and here's the question. Could you please state the allowed percentage of plus or minus in certain particle size and PDI for LNPs for successful reproducibility testing? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so in, in the in the uh, regulatory perspective, from regular perspective in the in the world of testing, when we're talking about the particle size, uh, so I like to use particle size and the size distribution because in most cases we are looking for a uh, a distribution control in, in instead of average particle size. So for most of the drug product containing nanomaterials in the nano uh, range, we are usually looking for D10, D50, D90 control with a certain range. Um, the, as I mentioned, um, the, those quality attributes or their acceptance criteria will depend on the, um, will depend on how it, it is used in clinic. Um, and also how the, uh, formulation and uh, manufacturing manufacturing process uh, well controlled to lead the uh, consistent uh, particle size and the size distribution. So we don't really have a, a percentage wise um, like plus or minus. We look at a range, uh, and this range for the, for example D10, D90, uh, D50, D90 will depend on. Uh, specific drug product we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We'd also like to welcome to our panel, welcoming back Dr. Neil Patry, and introduce to the Q&A panel, Dr. Olin Stevens, chemist in the Office of New Drug Products and OPQ. Moving on to our next panelist, we do have a few questions that came in for Dr. William Smith, and here is the first question for Dr. Smith. Is FFF, is FFF, three Fs, a technique accepted, a technique accepted by FDA for DP characterization? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so in general, you know, as we go into these the nanomaterial containing products or complex drug products, we see in applications a number of uh, kind of novel or innovative analytical approaches. So uh, any proposed analytical method by an applicant is well considered. Um, and kind of to Tina's point uh, previously, because these things are so complex and we, we still are in that kind of area where we really need uh, good analytical techniques uh, for characterizing these products. There is uh, a lot of opportunity uh, for using kind of some of these unique uh, uh, separations techniques or, or novel analytical methods. Um, FFF has been used for years and years in polymer and, and macromolecular uh, fields. 
Um, and I think in general, uh, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement in product characterization in pharmaceuticals uh, and for the development of some of these kind of more novel uh, techniques going forward. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Smith is the following. What do you mean by orthogonal methods? Okay, that is a good question. Uh, so in general, when we're measuring uh, any material or in, in this case, nanomaterials, uh, we tend to kind of group these uh, different techniques into kind of either orthogonal or complementary uh, methods. And so in general, uh, an orthogonal technique is going to be measuring the same, uh, what we say is like the same primary measurand. Uh, so like say particle size. And so an orthogonal technique would, uh, they both be measuring particle size, uh, but they will use different uh, physical principles for the measurement. Say cryo TEM is looking at a projected image. So it's me measuring uh, usually like the ferret diameter of a particle. Uh, versus something like uh, DLS, where uh, dynamic light scattering is measuring uh, primarily the diffusion coefficient and calculating uh, particle size. So they both are measuring particle size. They're using completely different physical principles. Uh, therefore, they're orthogonal to each other. Now, a complementary method would be something where uh, you're you're measuring the same per, uh, primary measurand, but uh, you are also um, using, uh, you know, some kind of similar principle. So say like uh, nano tracking analysis is also measuring the diffusion coefficient. Uh, you're looking at the same sample, you're getting two uh, particle sizes based on diffusion coefficient. Uh, those two uh, methods are complementary. Uh, so in general, uh, it's nice to kind of have a suite of both complementary and orthogonal techniques uh, when evaluating really complex uh, types of samples. Uh, hopefully that didn't get too semantic, but, but that's what we mean. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for responding to that question. As a follow-up to this question you just answered, Dr. Smith, which method or equipment is recommended for measuring 50 nanometer sized nanoparticle concentration in terms of particles per milliliter? And is it DLS based or an NTA based method? Okay, so that is another uh, good question. Uh, it is uh, in general for nanomaterials, it is very difficult to get uh, total particle concentration. So things like NTA are often used uh, because they directly are assessing or measuring individual particles. Um, that would tend to be one of the ways, if you're in that you know, 40 to 50 nanometers and above, uh, sometimes you can also use resistive pulse sensing uh, to do individual particle counts. Um, but in general, you never would use DLS uh, because it's just measuring the intensity of light uh, scattered. Uh, so for particle per mil uh, counts, there are fewer ways than for, say, micron particles to, to get that value. But those would be two ways that you could do it. Uh, thank you. And I, I realize now it's Ray, not Jeff. Sorry, Ray. <laughs> thank you for responding to that question. And one final question for Dr. Smith in this round. And here's the question. It's regarding unencapsulated drug product and how is it removed from nanoparticles and what techniques were used to determine the purity of the nanoparticles? Well, that is an interesting question. Uh, in general, at least for the, the systems that we were talking about, um, you have the, the loading, uh, as, as Tony described, is, is an active loading process where you have two streams of, you know, your empty liposomes and your, uh, say, your doxyl uh, hydrochloride. Uh, and there's an active mixing there in contact for some uh, period of time to get drug inside the particle. Uh, and the, the beauty of the continuous manufacturing is that after that, there's uh, another tangential flow filtration step 
uh, which basically acts as a diafiltration step to uh, remove any excess uh, free drug. Uh, so in general, you can think about, uh, you know, at the end of the process, all of the drug that is present there should be encapsulated as the free drug uh, tends to be uh, removed. Uh, as far as purity is concerned, uh, if you're talking drug distribution uh, between encapsulated and non-encapsulated, uh, it really depends on the on the product uh, as far as whether or not you can do it with something in situ, uh, like say a UV vis uh, shift in the peak uh, to show that the encapsulated form has a different signal than the the free form. Uh, or you can do some kind of preparative uh, separation like uh, like diafiltration uh, after the fact to uh, measure the purity. Um, I think those those are kind of the the two best ways. Um, yeah, thanks, Ray. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we have a group of questions that came in for Dr. Tina Morrison. And here's the first question for Dr. Morrison. So if one final product is found to be successful out of one of your science collaboration programs, who will then be the owner of this product? And who will be the third party to validate and investigate further details for final approval? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, and I think it really depends on the program. So I wanna highlight an example from the BAA program. So you all heard from Antonia Kostya's group at the University of Connecticut. They received um, funding through our BAA contract and they are the owners of the intellectual property there. And I believe if I'm remembering correctly, he started a, a small business um, that has um, now extended that technology. Um, and, and so there are opportunities through the contract mechanism for the developers of the technology to still maintain the rights to the property. In fact, if you all visit the FTA.gov website and you look for the BAA day from last year, 2022, there was a presentation from Dr. Alice Welch, who talked about the details of the intellectual property as a part of the research and development contracts mechanism. Now, when it comes to scientific collaborations through the CERCI program, again, these are cooperative agreement grants, and typically the IP stays with the investigators at the university. Now, to be more specific in terms of the different regulatory science outcomes that could impact, say, the regulatory process, those methodologies could be in the form of consensus standards, which those are actually belong to the, the community and can be referenced and utilized by anyone in the community. One of the ways in which FDA would get involved again in, a, in some kind of method or technique would be through our tools development programs. That's either part of the medical device development tools program or the drug development tools program. And so any independent organization can present those tools, those methodologies to FDA and work to receive qualification where FDA qualifies a very specific context of use for how those tools can be utilized in the regulatory process, either to support industry stakeholders or FDA in their evaluation of the different products. The last thing that I wanted to share with respect to um, the IP of, in, in any of these scientific collaborations is that those IP discussions always happen upfront. So depending on if the group is targeting a specific method or approach, um, it's really important that those conversations happen early between the external scientific stakeholders and FDA. Thank you for responding to that question, Dr. Morrison. We do have a few more questions for you, and here is the next question. How often does the FDA Scientific Working Group report out to the public, and where can we get the results from the FDA's current thinking on new methods, biomarkers, or toxicology? That's a terrific question. A lot of the FDA activity, the activities that come from the scientific working group, if the goal is to have an outward facing communication to the public or to our external stakeholders, 
all of those details would be available on our FDA.gov website. So a couple examples of some reports that have come out of the scientific working groups have been a recent report on the uh, update. There's an alternative methods report that came out in 2022. And recently, there has been some continuation of that discussion with a new alternative methods program. So there's a new website that communicates all the relevant information there. There has been a report from the modeling and simulation working group that came out in 2022, I believe in the fall, on successes and opportunities for modeling and simulation in, in the variety of different FDA products. There's also a predictive toxicology roadmap that the toxicology working group um, prepared, and that roadmap is also on the FDA.gov website. So we do our best when we are preparing reports or white papers that we put those on our FDA.gov website. Now, there was also this past spring a workshop on the, the biomarkers program, and the biomarkers program has actually put together a public, a scientific publication. And we tried to make those uh, publications also available on our FDA.gov website. And, I, and, and lastly, just to point out, while you can't find specific information just yet on the FDA.gov website about the scientific working groups, we are working to build uh, websites to communicate uh, in a more transparent way about the activities of the different scientific working groups. And so stay tuned for um, the showcase of the FDA website for those uh, hopefully coming in the next months. So thank you for the question. Thank you for responding, Dr. Morrison. We have a next question just came in. And here's the question. Is there no cooperative agreement grant with the VCU or international FDA or academia? Thanks, thanks for the question, Ray. Um, before I jump to the question about the cooperative agreement grants, I did want to just share with you, since I mentioned the tools program, both from the drug center and the device center, what I wanted to point out is when a tool is qualified, those details around the qualification are available on FDA's website as well. Um, so coming back to the question about a, a cooperative agreement grant with VCU, I'm gonna assume that means Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, and I don't believe there, we have a specific agreement with them that I'm aware of through our CERCI program. That being said, we have several other cooperative agreement grants with different institutions that are sponsored by specific centers. So for example, our Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition runs a CERCI program where they have four institutions that focus on regulatory science projects geared towards um, methodologies for food safety. Now, that is not part of the CERCI program that's run out of the Office of the Chief Scientist, so that's why you didn't hear me speak about that. Additionally, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research also hosts a myriad of cooperative agreement grants, and I actually believe there was one stood up earlier this year focusing on continuous manufacturing. So, I would encourage you to um, look for those um, other cooperative agreement grants through the FDA.gov website. Um, lastly, uh, I'm going to interpret international FDA to mean agreements with other regulatory bodies. And the short answer is yes, we do have other types of cooperative arrangements with regulatory bodies. When it comes to the regulatory process specifically for drugs, there is the International Committee on Harmonization, or ICH, that puts out a lot of guidelines that can be utilized across different regulatory bodies like the EMA and the PMDA in Japan. Additionally, for the medical device space, there is the uh, IMDRF, which is the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. In addition to those um, committees that focus on aspects of the regulatory process, the Office of the Chief Scientist is also pursuing opportunities for these uh, regulatory bodies to connect on areas of science together. So in a way to consider how we might be able to harmonize 
on different regulatory science topics, such as some of the ones I mentioned with respect to tools. And the alternative methods area is very ripe for us to think about how we might be able to collaborate scientifically with some of our counterparts at different regulatory institutions. And of course, we have, as you heard from my presentation, a myriad of different agreements with different um, universities. And we also have one last note about our engagement activities. You can look on FDA.gov's website for what we call Memorandum of Understanding. And the, there's hundreds of these MOUs that we put together with a variety of different organizations, including academia, where if we're trying to work on a specific initiative together, we outline the scope of that initiative and who the partners are as a part of that. So I encourage you to check out um, FDA's Memorandum of Understandings, and you can find national and international MOUs on that website. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one more question for Dr. Morrison. It's a, it's a two-part question. We'll pose a question to uh, Dr. Morrison first, and then if Dr. Morrison can pass over to Dr. Olin Stevens for a follow-up response. And here is the question. How come there's no special program for cancer, treat, cancer treatment while, while there is a special program for tobacco products? Yeah, thank you for that. So I, there are actually a special program just to, to utilize the same language as the, the person who asked the question. What I will say in the overview of the FDA, there are product centers and those centers focus on the specific regulatory aspects of products. So yes, there is a tobacco center. That being said, the FDA acknowledges a key role for um, coordinating efforts across the medical product centers. That would be the drug center, the biologic center, and the medical device center. There's a coordinated effort through what's called the Oncology Center of Excellence, which is one of the component offices as a part of the office of the commissioner. And that office does in fact focus on a variety of um, devices and drugs and, and methodologies for clinical trials specifically geared towards cancer treatment. Um, Dr. Stevens, do you have some additional remarks to add? Oh, sorry, there it goes. Yeah, thank you for passing it over. Um, I actually am a reviewer uh, that supports the Oncology Center for Excellence. And I believe it was two years ago that the SBIA ran their own um, their own two-day seminar uh, with the Oncology Center of Excellence. So I'd refer you back to, uh, to those programs that were discussed two years ago on SBIA's website. Uh, and as Dr. Morrison mentioned, there are a number of programs that are specifically geared on the review side towards promoting products for oncology. One of them is Project Catalyst, which is uh, which fosters early stage product uh, innovation, and another related one called the Oncology Regulatory Expertise and Early Guidance. And this this is targeted at uh, product type device that comes in even before. Um, a pre-IND meeting package comes in. So there are active programs that reach out and help to address regulatory issues for early stage product development um, before they would come in for an application to, pre uh, to prevent them from immediately going on hold and to help them in their own development. So thank you for the question. Thank you for responding to that question. We'd like to bring Dr. Morrison back in uh, to provide some uh, follow-up statements on cancer treatments. Dr. Morrison? Yeah, thanks again. I just wanted to highlight, as I mentioned in my overview of the regulatory science framework, that the regulatory science framework highlights areas of science that can impact multiple centers, can impact projects, uh, different product areas, excuse me, or different demographics and populations. What I want to point out is for those of you working in that space of oncology, I encourage you to look at the upcoming BAA solicitation 
it's in the details of the solicitation that you'll be able to find the most imminent science priorities for all of the centers. And in particular, you will find several um, key priority areas for from the Oncology Center of Excellence. So there is a there is an, um, a mechanism currently available for you to get more information on what are some of the science priorities related to oncology and cancer treatments. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving up to the beginning of our panel, we've got a question that just came in for Dr. William Smith. And here is the question. Is it possible to incorporate hydrodynamic size measurement techniques like FFF, DLS, or NTA in line with continuous measurement so that the aliqua of the product is measured as soon as the synthesis is completed and a real-time information is obtained during the synthesis process? Okay, hold on. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. So in general, uh, because of how the measurement principles of both FFF and NTA work, um, you could do those technically like at line. You wouldn't be able to do those in an online uh, fashion. Uh, as opposed to the dynamic light scattering, there's been a really uh, recent and interesting development that uh, Tony uh, Costa talked about in his talk, uh, which is using DLS as a, an online PAT uh, system. And so that is using what is called uh, spatially resolved uh, dynamic light scattering. Uh, and so that has a number of advantages uh, despite uh, you know, also being able to measure things at flow conditions, so at high flow rates, uh, but also in uh, relatively turbid systems. So if you are really interested, uh, I'd go back and look at some of uh, Tony's papers, or you can look up uh, specifically uh, spatially resolved dynamic light scattering, and that is currently being used uh, online on, uh, you know, nano uh, continuous manufacturing systems to provide that real-time feedback about particle size uh, for those systems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for responding to that question. We do have a couple more questions that just came in for you, and here's the next question. You mentioned the use of, of a orthogonal particle size te technique, sizing techniques. Why would someone use one of these separation techniques it's over a quicker or simpler method like batch DLA. Oh, that, thanks for that also. I think in general, there is something to be said for the ubiquity and use of uh, things like uh, DLS. They are simple and uh, quick. But again, the, the resolution capability and the fact that you're uh, looking at an ensemble of every particle that's in the system and those tend to be, uh, you know, the sizes you get tend to be skewed uh, to the larger size range due to the intensity-based uh, nature of the, of the measurement phenomena um, lends itself to the fact that you might want uh, if you see some kind of polydispersity in your sample to go to a separation based technique because um, so like in TEM, you might be looking at 100 to 1000 particles uh, in a separation technique, you're looking at on the order of like 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10 number of particles and it really helps you to identify those particle subpopulations that are leading to uh, that polydispersity. And with, you know, something like uh, an FFF approach, you can also collect those for subsequent offline analysis. And there's some really good work by the Nanometrology Institute in Japan, uh, where they demonstrated that if you separate a sample, uh, fractionate it and do TEM in order to get a, a really definitive particle size distribution, uh, 
while coupling to transmission electron microscope, you only really need to measure between uh, 20 to 100 particles per image uh, to get a really nice uh, look at the particle sample um, distribution. So the combination of uh, the number of particles you're looking at, the subpopulations you can identify, and then complementary offline or orthogonal offline analysis uh, is just uh, indispensable for looking at the whole picture of what's inside one of these complex uh, nanomaterial containing products. Uh, thanks, Ray. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Dr. Smith, and it's the following. You discussed the use of shape factor analysis for liposomal products, but are there other products that this could be applied to? Yeah, so this is uh, another uh, great uh, question. Um, in general, because of how the shape factor analysis actually works, you're kind of looking at a mass distribution inside of your analyte. Uh, so there's been a couple recent publications, I think from uh, both NCL, NIST, and uh, uh, Fanny Caputo and, and Jeremy Perot, where they looked at the loading, so different mass loadings of uh, mRNA, or RNA into lipid nanoparticles, and you could use that shape factor analysis to uh, look at something as uh, kind of a, uh, a metric for RNA loading. Uh, I know they also use this in polymer micelles uh, as, and a number of other things. So I, I see this being uh, used in further uh, nanomaterial characterization in, in the future for all of those types of products. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving up to the beginning of our panelists, we've got a few questions that came in for Dr. Hailing Zhang. And here is the first question for Dr. Zhang. In addition to Doxel, FDA has also approved many other liposomal drug products. Can you highlight some of the differences of other liposome drug products in terms of quality considerations? Um, thank you for that question. So uh, yes, um, we, in addition to Doxel, uh, FDA also approved uh, quite a few liposome drug products. Um, and uh, some of the drug products actually have a different uh, morphology from Doxel. Therefore, uh, they could have a different um, quality attributes when we uh, look at the quality. Um, for example, if we look at um, amphotericin B liposome products, it's a it's a liposome drug product where the amphotericin B is embedded within the lipid bilayer without PEG. So uh, obviously, when we look at the quality characterization, quality consideration and control for amphotericin, we look at different um, uh, properties. Um, so. That's just one example I would like to highlight. So I guess depending on the um, the design and also the intent of the uh, drug product, uh, we the quality attributes, the critical quality attributes, characterization testing, uh, will be very different from one to another. Um, so um, quality by design and the risk-based approach are always uh, critical in terms of um, development and also uh, reg regulatory um, assessment and approval of a, a drug product containing nanomaterials. Uh, thank you, Ray. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got another question for Dr. Zhang, and here's the question. There are no quality guidance guidances specifically for lipid nanoparticle drug products. Do you have any recommendations in terms of what guidance industry should follow when developing lipid nanoparticle drug products? Um, thank you for that question. Um, it's true that we, we uh, the agency has not published any specific quality guidance for drug products containing using a lipid nanoparticle as a drug carrier. Um, However, due to, due to the similarity between liposome drug products and uh, lipid nanoparticle drug products, uh, lots of um, principles uh, highlighted in the uh, liposome drug product um, 
guidance I mentioned in my presentation, it's uh, highly applicable. Um, you know, I think this is also noticed by industry. Um, we, we do see the industry um, follow the guidance uh, when they develop drug products using lipid nanoparticle as a drug, as the drug carrier. Um, so uh, that's one guidance I would recommend. Another one is the one I already also mentioned in the presentation, which is the um, newly published guidance for drug products, including uh, biologics containing nanomaterials. They are, they, this guidance um, contains some high level uh, recommendations, um, uh, you know, including the quality consideration uh, for, for the product in that category. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Dr. Zane in regarding generic drug product development and what are the specific challenges for developing a generic drug product containing nanomaterials? Um, that's a great question. Thank you very much. And also, also so a relevant question uh, from the audience asking if there are any gener generic version of Daxo on the US market. Uh, I think I mentioned in my presentation, we approved uh, five uh, AND submissions for Daxorubensin uh, hydrochloride liposome injection uh, between 2013 and now. We still have a few in our pipeline. Um, so there are some uh, unique challenges, you know, uh, when coming to um, developing and uh, assess and approve generic drug product. The um, biggest challenge, I would like to say, is the uh, establish the equivalency between, between the ROD and the, the old reference drug product and the testing generic drug product, especially uh, with regard to the liposomal uh, physical chemical properties um, because of the complexity. Um, of the formulation and also manufacturing manufacturing process. Um, uh, another challenge um, I would like to highlight, I think uh, Xiaomi and other um, other um, speakers also highlight, is that the the characterization um, in terms of the uh, analytical method uh, method validation and also data interpretation. Um, you know, um, so we look, we uh, tackle the, this challenge from um, the uh, totality of the data. Uh, so when we look at a generic submission for a drug product containing nanomaterials, for example, liposomal drug product, we not we will not rely on one single characterization testing. We usually rely on the um, the, the, the full picture, the development program, you know, how the risk could be mitigated during the development uh, to establish the equivalency between the RS, the reference product, uh, versus the uh, testing generic product. Um, another challenge is the uh, drug product release and testing. Uh, what should be included? What should not be included? Um, we also uh, look at this this uh, challenge from a uh, uh, really the totality perspective. Uh, for example, we usually asking uh, morphology testing be included, uh, but lots of the morphology testing also using um, ha has to use very unconventional method. For example, cryo TEM. We do acknowledge uh, the challenging using the uh, Cryo TEM as a QA tool, uh, quality assurance tool, or quality control tool. Um, so we will look at the history of the uh, development program um, submitted by the sponsor and sometimes negotiate and have agreement with the industry in terms of some really complex testing. You know, how frequent should be tested, how many samples should be tested. Uh, so in that way, we do have some level of flexibility uh, with regard um, with regarding uh, to the testing. Uh, I hope I answered the questions. Um, thank you, Ray.
Thank you for responding to that question. We've got just over a couple of minutes left. Moving on to uh, Dr. Tina Morrison, we have a question that just came in and hopefully we can get this answered. And here is the question for Dr. Morrison. Can you describe how the BAA contracts differ from the CERCI grants? Thank you so much. So it's my understanding the audience participating in this workshop today as mainly our colleagues from the external scientific community. And there are two different ways I discussed that we can engage with our collaborators on different projects. Now, if you are interested in a CERCI project, it's really critical that you connect with those five different institutions, a PI at those institutions, and connect with them on ways in which you might be able to establish a project with them and potentially with the FDA. So we are not able to directly give funding to our external collaborators outside of the CERCI program through the CERCI grants. Our funding for that grant program goes directly to those institutions for a specific project. Now we have with the BAA contracts, this is an opportunity where on a yearly basis, we put out a call or a request for scientific proposals to address the myriad of scientific priorities that FDA has. And as I mentioned in the response to one of my questions earlier, we publish an annual solicitation on the sam.gov website. That's sam.gov. You can search for the BAA. And you're welcome to submit a proposal um, to the FDA to demonstrate the technical merit of the work that you're doing, the team that you have, and the approach of the project that you think can actually support FDA. And then we, FDA would fund you directly for that work and would work alongside to ensure deliverables and milestones are met. So one mechanism is directly to the offerers is what we call them. And the other mechanism is to the academic institutions by way of connecting with those uh, investigators. Thank you so much. Well, that's all the time we have for questions in our final panel. A huge thank you to our speakers and panelists for answering numerous questions that came in from our audience. For our symposium closing, closing we'd like to welcome back Dr. Olin Stevens to provide some closing remarks. Welcome, Dr. Stevens. Thanks, Ray. Well, we've made it through an entire day of talks and vigorous Q&A. I wanted to thank our speakers, our behind the scenes technical support, and especially you, our participating res registrants. Your interest in this field makes this event possible. Your questions help drive our research, policy development, and future symposia. I hope that we can all continue to, quote, learn from the future, as Zhao Ming suggested, so we can learn from current trends and your questions to anticipate the future, and maybe positively influence that future. Hopefully the talks today help the nanomaterial field to make future products that are accessible to, uh, in the future, allow industry to remain agile for an uncertain future, facilitate individualized medicines that are affordable, and engender the public's trust in these future therapeutics. Whether we impact the future by early engagement with the emerging technology team or by in-process PAT controls that look into the future quality of the product or through understanding the potential of some of the new manufacturing processes that we heard about, maybe we all got a glimpse into that future. Again, the technical depth of your questions received were impressive and helpful. We will take the questions we fielded today as well as those we were unable to answer into consideration for our future regulatory actions and communications. Thank you for this feedback. I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Zhu for his leadership in organizing this symposium with this SBIA and their network for helping connect all of you. So I thank you for your participation today, and hopefully the symposium has influenced your participation in future NANA Day events. Uh, Ray, can you close us out with your admin updates? <laughs>